Good morning, Betty. How are you? Good morning. Wait a minute. Okay. What just happened? Oh, okay. Tapped on the wrong thing. There we go. All right. How's everybody doing? Good. Oh. Hello, everyone. Hello, everybody. Good morning. Hey, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. How are we all doing? Okay, Mark, un unmute yourself there. Say hi to everybody. Okay, so um, we're going to jump right into this uh, because we have. Hello, good everybody. Good morning. Hello. A lot to cover. Okay. Uh, Hello, what was it last week? Uh, someone asked about uh, doing a little more art history, and in particular, they were interested in the Renaissance, and so uh, I pulled some material on that, and uh, now this is actually going to take several different sessions to go through, so we won't get through it all today, but today what I want to do is I want to give you a kind of a general uh, idea and a timeline of what the differences are between uh, what we consider Renaissance art and what came before, which uh, was really the Middle Ages and, uh, you know, what, what they call the Dark Ages. Hey, Charles. And, yes. It's Fran. What about High Renaissance that came after the Renaissance? Well, like we'll, okay. Yeah, we'll, we'll, yeah, we'll be talking about, you know, the Renaissance is a generalized period of time which took up actually several hundred years. And uh, yeah, there was a considerable shift in um, you know, how art was produced and what the subject matter was. And we're gonna be talking about hopefully all of that. Okay? Thank but you. Gonna, yeah, but we're gonna get started. And uh, the very first thing I'm gonna do, uh, oh, okay. Uh, we got a gentleman here who uh, was new to us today. And his name is Robert, um, or Bob, um, Bob Homer. Bob, can you unmute yourself? Maybe I'll do it for you. Okay, we'll try to unmute everybody. Okay, uh, well, all right, that did that. See, that didn't work. Yeah. Okay. All right, are you Bob? Hi, Bob. Hi, Bob. How are you doing? I'm Charles. Uh, nice to meet you, Charles. I'm okay. doing well, thank you. All right. Welcome, you know, to our little class. Uh, we're we're going to be talking a little bit about art history today, and uh, we have a class coming back at two o'clock. Just in case you don't know that, I'll send you the links for it. Um, which we share artwork, and I'm going to try to hold true with that. If you guys have things to send me, I know Betty and Eloise had sent me some pieces. Uh, I don't have anything from anybody else at this point, right? But let's I get into you some pieces. Uh, today? Dean Goldstein. Today? No, last uh, Thursday or Friday or when we didn't have the class last week yeah. sometime, Wednesday or Thursday. Um, when we get the class. We have class Friday. Yeah, we had a class on Friday. Anyway, all right, well, we'll talk about that later. Let's get started, okay? So the first thing I'm going to sh share with you is kind of a timeline. Uh, so uh, if you want to do a screen capture of this or whatever, it might help you to hold on to this. Um, just because when we start talking about these different periods of art, it might help you kind of understand where you are, okay? So, uh, you know, if you go all the way back to Egypt, you know, that's, that's around, you know, 2,500 years before, you know, Western timelines or, you know, before after Christ, right? And so we're talking about 2,500 BC and of course, a lot of things were going on in the world, you know, at that point in time, not just in Egypt, but in Europe and everywhere else. Um, but, you know, we get to the period of time we're talking about, which is at the time of the Roman Empire, 
or at the end of the Roman Empire. And interestingly enough, the world was thrown into uh, really what they call the Dark Ages. And that was really a collapse of what we would call, you know, the modern society at that time. A lot of the institutions broke down, um, you know, governments, uh, nations kind of split apart again. And they went back into a, well, it's referred to as the Dark Ages, but it was really a time when it was uh, feudal lords, um, you know, families and, and people who had power over small areas. Uh, and then they had, uh, there were basically two classes, well, really three classes of people. You had the aristocracy or, you know, the royals. Um, you had a craftsman class who were the skilled laborers. And then everybody else was peasants. You didn't have a middle class. So everybody worked, you know, for those, you know, for the aristocracy. And, you know, pretty much so that was the structure of society. And there was no mobility, you know, there was no way of moving up, up that ladder in any way. Uh, you were either born into, you know, being, you know, of, of royal birth. And if you weren't, too bad, you know, you just were where, where you were and that was life. Well, you know, that persisted for almost a thousand years. Uh, and if you think about it, that's a really long time and slowly uh, several things happened. One, the population of Europe continued to grow and you got up to around about in the 1300s, you had around about 70 million people uh, in Europe. Now, you know, we look at our country today and we have 320 million in America today. Uh, but in all of Europe at that time in 1300, they had about 70 million people. Now, just as a uh, kind of a coincidence as to what's happening today, uh, they had an, a, an epidemic or a pandemic, if you want to call it. Uh, they had what they called the Black Death, and that was right around about 1340, 1350, of which it, it killed, out of that 70 million people, it killed almost 22 million of those. So about one third of the population died off. And any progress that had been made up until that point had all of a sudden, you know, kind of come to a screeching halt. And it took uh, a fairly long period of time, uh, about another hundred years or so, uh, for societies and things to regroup and to begin moving forward. And that's really what we kind of refer to as the beginning of the Renaissance, right? Now, Western art history sort of focuses in particular uh, on Italy as the place of the birth of the Renaissance. And that is somewhat true, okay? But the things that were happening, you know, in Italy at that time uh, were also beginning to happen in some other parts of the world uh, as well, uh, such as in North Africa, in the Islamic uh, kingdoms in the Middle East, uh, also in India, uh, and also in like China. So, you know, people were moving forward, you know, with uh, advances in architecture, in, you know, visual arts, uh, in a lot of different ways. But the Renaissance in particular is sort of one of those those points of time where you see this drastic shift and not just in the visual art but also in sort of the underlying philosophy of society um, the dark ages had pretty much so in the middle ages had pretty much so been you know where you were in your particular place in life and there was no real mobility. If you were born as a peasant, you were going to die as a peasant. Uh, and the same thing was true if you were of royal birth. Now, in the Renaissance, uh, because of the advances in society, that began to shift a little bit. And you had people in the craft class 
that were becoming sort of independent and beginning to sort of create their own, what we would call, you know, businesses or studios. But you also had merchants who were beginning to travel to other parts of the world and work back, you know, goods uh, and things that, uh, you know, like silk, different types of cloth, things like that, that hadn't really been available in Europe for a very long time. So those people all of a sudden began to build what we call a middle class. And so people began to accumulate wealth and they weren't necessarily of royal birth. And with the expansion of that middle class and the prosperity of that time, uh, you know, people could then afford to actually commission art. And so you have families like, uh, for example, the Medici uh, in Italy, who began to commission artists, uh, you know, for their own purposes. Now the church had been, you know, kind of eking along the whole time. And the Roman Catholic Church in particular had uh, done very well for itself and pretty much so dominated all of European religion, uh, other than uh, there were relatively small pockets of uh, Jewish enclaves throughout Europe. Uh, but for the most part, it was the Roman Catholic Church that was the dominant religion. They, uh, during the dark in the Middle Ages, they had pushed out um, all of the uh, Islamic strongholds in Spain, in Turkey, you know, all even into Greece and uh, Macedonia. Um, you know, they had basically pushed all the Islamic uh, religious uh, folks out of Europe at that point in time. And so it was really pretty much so just left to the Catholics. Um, now, so you have a timeline of right around uh, about 1350, right at the end of the Black Death, all the way to uh, in the 15 and 1600s, that we pretty much so talk about, you know, being part of the Renaissance, right? So now we're going to get to the next group. <clears throat> so I'm going to show you a couple of pieces of art that uh, were pretty, pretty much of good examples of what we would consider medieval uh, art. Okay, now look carefully, you know, at this painting. Now this was uh, by a, uh, a gentleman who was a, a master painter. His name was uh, Ducio. And he was a contemporary of another artist that we'll talk quite a bit about today, uh, and that's Giotto. Now, Ducio painted in um, a pretty traditional medieval or Gothic style. And what do you notice about this painting when you look at it? Anybody have any comments? It's religious. What is it? A religious paint. Well, yeah, it, it's definitely a religious theme to this painting. What else? Well, the, the main uh, focus of it is centered right in the middle. Yes, it is. And what else can you tell me about it? Everybody has a halo. Uh, yeah, there's a lot of halos going around the room. Yeah, there's been a lot of angels or something there. Well, the same. yeah, very pious people, I would say. It's very stealthy. Very what? It seems to be a little flat to me, though. Uh-huh. Well, yeah, it does. It has sort of a flat appearance, doesn't it? There's uh, an attempt at dimension, though. Um, like the brighter colors are in the foreground. The, the colors get lighter as it goes back. Um, the size doesn't change much, though. Okay. Charles, well, yes. was it a paint on the walls of the churches? And didn't they use a certain type of paint called ghetto or gatto or something like that? I'm not too sure. Gesso? Yeah, something like that. Yeah, gesso had been used for a long time before the market. 
but and we can talk about that a little bit later. But I, an old way of the church built a uh, building on either side of the, uh, I guess it's a chair. Yeah. Now, a lot of these paintings were not done on the wall, okay? Uh, mm -hmm. what they were done is they were done on wooden panels. Okay. And what you're talking about when they're actually painting on the wall itself is mm -hmm. a technique that they call fresco. That's the one I wanted. Right. Yes. yes. Now, fresco has all... been around for quite a bit of time, but paintings up until that period of time have pretty much so been done on wood panels. And this particular painting is part of an altarpiece that sits, you know, at the front of the church, kind of behind where the... Uh, they all look alike. They have a long slender nose and they don't look realistic to me. Yeah. But that was a style at the time, though, I think. Well, it, it was. And here's the key thing that I want to point out to you, okay? because it, it really talks a lot about what the attitude of people were during that period of time. Do you notice that the focal point, which is Mary, and then the baby Jesus, um, look at the size of them in comparison to everybody else. Yeah, they have big ones. yeah. Mary was a big girl. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> she was a big girl. Uh, no, and she, she wasn't. I mean, reality was, you know, she was just a normal human being like everybody else. But the way that painters treated their, their subjects to idealize them, you know, whether it was somebody who was from a royal family or, you know, whoever the most important person was in the painting, they were bigger. You know, they, you know, in scale, they made them larger because that was the focal point. That's what they were talking about. And in this particular case, it's Mary and Jesus. And everybody else, you know, the wise men and all of, you know, the people who came to the birth of Jesus, you know, surrounding them were less important, okay? So, and that had a lot to do with, again, it's that attitude of your place in society, say. And so if you were not as important, you were much smaller. And if you were more important, then they made you considerably larger. And so there's this kind of caste system, um, you know, or this, this stratification of society. And everybody had their place, you know, and that kind of ruled how you were depicted, if you ever were, you know, in some kind of image. So let's, let's move on. Okay, here's a, another piece. Now, I'm not sure exactly who did this uh, piece, but again, look at, you know, those same basic elements. You know, look at how they treat the size relationships of the focal point. Again, this is Mary. They did a lot of paintings about Mary. For, Mary know. and angels. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but look at her in comparison to everybody else around her. And you see, even the lords, you know, uh, these guys up here are, are clearly uh, royalty of some sort. And again, look at the size relationship of them to all the court and the people around them. See? Again, you know, treated, you know, with the scale, you know, very differently. Now, you can make you know, you can make a lot of observations about medieval and, and, you know, art during that period after the Roman Empire. And even though those societies collapsed, there were still a lot of very, very skilled artisans around. And they continued to work, they continued to pass their skills down. And when you begin to look at, like, this painting in particular, uh, let me blow this up a little bit. This is not all just straight painting. There's actually like metal leaf, you know, uh, on some of these patterns and things. Um, and so, you know, you actually have like gold leaf with paint, you know, on this wooden surface. And so again, you know, that's, that's something that takes a lot of skill. You know, not all painters 
uh, can really handle and really manipulate metal leaf um, that accurately. And it, it, it takes a long time to acquire that skill mm -hmm. and do it well. Charles? Yes? It's Fran again. <clears throat> In the Middle Ages, wasn't it so that the church had the power, the control, and the money, and that the artists could only paint for them? Well, yeah, up up through like the dark in the Middle Ages. Yes. About the only game in town was the church. Right. Yeah, uh, because even the feudal lords who held land at that time, they really didn't have that much power or that much wealth. They had power over a small area but they didn't really have um, any developed trade network or anything that they could really acquire, you know, that <coughs> well. So they really couldn't afford to keep, you know, a lot of craftsmen and artisan alive, uh, where the church, on the other hand, uh, here's a, a final example. And again, you know, this is a fairly typical mid medieval piece of art. And uh, again, you know, look at the scale, uh, you know, of Mary again, you know, the central figure to all of the angels and things around her. So I wanted to show you those because I wanted you to get a good idea of, you know, what med medieval art sort of looked like and a lot of the thinking process behind it. And the important thing is really what they're showing is the separation in class, um, you know, between the subject and, you know, the other people involved in the painting. Now, we're going to move forward. And I found a, a really, really good um, presentation. <clears throat> that again, kind of goes through a lot of this material I just discussed, but I, I thought they did a great presentation. Um, and we're going to start back here. Now, this is really kind of talking about the late Gothic period and, um, and then how it moved forward into the Renaissance. Okay. So we have uh, the late Gothic period, and you have two particular artists. Um, Semobo in Florence, who was the master and teacher of uh, the person we're going to talk mainly about today, which is Giotto. And then you had Ducio, who uh, had, you know, the people that he taught, right? And you saw one of Ducio's paintings uh, earlier. And so, you know, he was a very skilled craftsman. Uh, now, he was in Siena, uh, which is another uh, small city in Italy. Uh, and then, so, you know, you had, you know, late Gothic, uh, which is the late 12, early 1300s, you had the Black Death that I had mentioned, and they wiped, that wiped out pretty much about 25% of the population. Um, and then you sort of started, you know, after that period of time, you had the beginning of the Renaissance, right? Um, now think about, if you will, at that period of time. Uh, this is about the time when, or up until that time that they, the, the main art form that was really remaining from that period of time are what we call Gothic churches. Does everybody, anybody kind of familiar with what a Gothic church looked like? Um, uh -huh. they were, they were yeah, pretty. Christ the King is Gothic. Gothic. Christ the King is a Gothic church. Okay. Well, I'm going to yeah, show well, a couple examples of those. Um, but again, all right. So the main activity, you know, around art was really in building these churches in these communities. And the thing is, uh, these churches were not built like within a couple of years. Literally, some of these uh, several years to build, and they're amazing pieces of architecture. Um, I'm going to skip forward a little bit. Actually, yeah. 
let's go to this guy right here. Okay. That's my guy. So that's that's a fairly typical, um, you know, middle age or you know, an elite Gothic church, right? And the architecture, you know, looks fairly bland, fairly simple, uh, you know, on the outside, but on the interior, what it did is it afforded them a lot of space. You had all of these large wall spaces that could then be covered with, you know, paintings. And in this particular case, uh, a lot of these are uh, frescoes and they're actually painted, you know, on the wall. And um, this particular church, uh, there was a whole series of paintings that were done and they were all done by one. And uh, this, this whole church, all of these paintings do with the story of the life of Christ. And that's all the way from the time when he was born, all the way up until uh, the crucifixion and the resur resurrection at that point. And so, so was which person who paid for that, uh, they are saying? Well, that would have been the Catholic Church. That's who he was working for. Yeah. Um, here's a, you know, that, that's one of the pieces uh, in one of those Gothic churches. Again, you know, so the, uh, I guess the pastor or whatever would, you know, stand up here. This would be the, the pulpit. You know, fairly elaborate, you know, highly detailed. Okay. And again, this is all late Gothic going into the Renaissance, right? So, moving forward, if you look at, here's three examples, and we've kind of done this somewhat already. Um, if you look at the style and the treatment of each of these paintings in these different periods, and notice how they've sort of changed and how artists have made, you know, certain advances. Um, like for example, you know, in the uh, Byzantine period, all of the figures are very stylized. I think Eloise pointed that out. Um, they were more ideals of people. They were not really interested in trying to capture an actual likeness of that person. And again, you know, it's because they, they were more religious symbols than they were real people. You know, you, you know, artists and the painters. And then you move into uh, late God. I imagine no country folks sitting up saying, well, you should have called me. Wait, 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 let me show you on mute. Okay, can, uh, here, maybe somebody needs to mute themselves. Um, anyway. Uh, moving into the late Gothic, you know, people become a little more naturalistic looking, you know, and a little rounder, uh, a little more human-like. Um, and then you move into the Renaissance and all of a sudden, you know, there's this very big break in the way that, you know, those people were treated. If you begin to look at this Renaissance painting over to the far right, could you yeah. move our pictures off of it so we could see it better? Say what now? Uh, could you move our pictures off of it so we can see it better? Move your pictures off of it? Yeah. yeah we got like one, two, it got you and, and three others to the, on my right, covering the, the Renaissance version in child. Okay. Well, just, just, hit, the, just hit, the minus, the hit the minus on the picture. Yeah, well, I think, yeah, I think what you can do is you can move that, Gene. How do you move it? Get out of your gallery view. Yeah, you just, you just click on it, go to the top, just click on it, and you can shift it around, you know, out of the way, or you can, you know, close it. Got so, it. Okay. Also, Gene, you could do on the right, uh, do it, there's, there's three bars on the left-hand side where your names are. If you click on that first horizontal bar, you'll, you'll 
be able to see the whole picture. Yeah. You see it? Uh, yes. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. You're welcome. All right. So, so as you can see, you know, kind of a radical difference between what was done in the late Gothic and then all of a sudden in the Renaissance. Um, look at the setting, you know, that the figure is sitting in, and all of a sudden you can begin to see that there's actually some depth. Uh, somebody was saying how the Gothic and, uh, you know, middle age paintings were kind of flat. Well, the Renaissance, all of a sudden, it's like these paintings take on some actual depth and dimension, uh, you know, and figures feel a little more naturalistic. Yeah. And, and the Renaissance to me looked like it's a real girl sitting there and then he painted. Right. Okay. And, and, and again, that's what I was saying. It's a little more naturalistic. It's what we would expect to see if we were really somewhere, you know, sitting here having a conversation with that person. Now, that didn't happen by accident, you know. Um, the reason that happened was that there was this major shift in society about the view of people and their place. Uh, again, late Gothic period, you know, you was fairly stagnant as far as, and if you were born into a poor family, you were poor the rest of your life. That was not gonna change. In the Renaissance, all of a sudden, there were these possibilities that you could begin to change your status based on your skill or, you know, your effort, you know, to work. If you wanted to become a merchant, you know, uh, you, know you could build and acquire wealth. That was something that was, you know, never possible before. And with that, you know, artists, as well as just the population in general, began to take on this new energy and this new view of life that had not prevailed, you know, for many centuries before that. So it really was a, a key and pivotal point in history, um, both art history as well as, you know, general history. Um, so we had, uh, Here's some terms that they came up with. These are different stages. Uh, talking about Christ's life. And again, you know, Giotto did a whole series of paintings on Christ's life. And so when you look at the titles of these, like the Annunciation, the Visitation, the Adoration, yada, yada, um, what they're talking about is, you know, particular things that happen you know, in that story in the Bible. Uh, the other thing that happened, uh, and again, this is one of uh, Giotto's pieces of work. I'll blow this up a little bit. You know, in, in the Gothic period, you know, again, a lot of those figures look kind of flat and with the beginning of the Renaissance, and particularly with Giotto, uh, there was a, uh, an approach or a technique that was created, it's called chiaroscuro, right? Now this is chiaroscuro in its very early stages, but all of a sudden, rather than just all of the flesh being sort of this flat color, um, all of a sudden you have these very subtle gradations and changes in value. And this began to give, you know, this dimensional look to those figures so that they were not quite so flat. Now, you know, when I look at Giotto's work, you know, to me, you know, I still more or less feel it's pretty flat, okay? Um, but, you know, it begins to have some some sense of roundness, some sense of form. And that was a huge step forward, right? Uh, again, you know, when you begin to look at the scale of the figures, right? Uh, there's still a little bit of difference, you know, between, you know, the figures, but it's not as extreme as it was in the early Middle Ages. Okay. Uh, 
Uh, here's another example of Giotto's work. Now, one thing I want to point out, in particular with Giotto, um, there was a lot of blue in his paintings, right? Now, why is that significant? Uh, first of all, there was very little available in Europe at the time to create blue pigment, right? And if you needed the color blue, that means that you had to bring minerals, uh, particularly one particular menu, mineral that came from Afghanistan. It was called lapis lazuli. And that lapis lazuli had to be ground uh, into a powder and then made into a paint pigment. And um, other than that, you could use some berries and things like that to create blue, but the problem was that they faded very quickly. They were not archival, they were not permanent. And the only way that you could get any kind of a bluish color that would last you know, for a long period of time that would be light, fast, and permanent was to use lapis. And so the only ones who could really afford to actually do that was the Catholic Church, okay? Uh, later on, you know, as you had the rise of the merchant class and people became more wealthy, it became ultimate. But um, if you look at a lot of those medieval paintings, things like that, you saw very little blue in them. Uh, at the beginning of the Renaissance, that changed, and in particular, Giotto, who used um, vast amounts of blue in his paintings. Uh, here's another painting by Giotto. And again, that bluish background. And also look at the architecture. You know, look at the buildings. Um, if you look at these, they still look a little bit like a diagram, don't they? They don't really feel as dimensional, you know, as what we would really expect to see, you know, a painting of buildings. You know, they're somewhat flat. Even though the figures are becoming a little more dimensional, you know, perspectives at that point had not really been, uh, you know, elevated to the point that we understand it now. You know, you didn't have two and three point perspective. So it kind of looked a lot like a planned diagram. Uh, let's see, where do we want to go? Okay, so here, there's, you know, this is the uh, Church of Fra uh, Francis of Assisi, St. Francis, right? That was the Franciscan order. And that's clearly a Gothic building. Right? Oh, uh, look, just look at the architecture, you know, the arches, you know, there's oh, some, some ornament on it but it's really a fairly simple, plain looking building. And then you get into the Renaissance <laughs> and look at the difference, okay? And so, you know, you had these uh, cathedrals being built, you know, at the time and the architectural principles changed radically. Uh, you know, you had the arch, you know, that was left over from Rome. They understood, you know, a little bit about the engineering and how to engineer, you know, a vaulted roof and to support that, um, you know, fairly successfully. But, you know, with the Gothic churches, you know, there was this desire to open those up and create this large open space that up until that time, they had really never been able to do. And when you go inside of a Gotham church, that's pretty much so what they look like, okay? So you've got these two walls supporting it on the side, and then you look at the arches and how many arches are sort of connected together to support that roof and things above it. And again, that gives you uh, this opportunity 
to create all of this visual imagery, you know, along the sides, you know, of the church. <clears throat> 